In Acts chapter 26, King Herod Agrippa II and his sister Bernice came to Caesarea to visit the new Roman governor of Palestine, Festus, and to congratulate him on his new appointment. Herod Agrippa II was the great-grandson of Herod the Great. He had inherited his uncle Herod's kingdom of Chalcis, located in Lebanon. As a youth, Herod Agrippa had been raised in the household of the emperor Claudius, and he had been a favorite of the emperor. Claudius wanted to make Herod Agrippa II king over all of Palestine in AD 44. But Agrippa had only been 17 years old at the time, and so Palestine had been ruled by Roman governors ever since. This explains why Festus, not Agrippa, was ruling over Palestine. During their visit in Caesarea, Festus informed Agrippa and Bernice about Paul's case. Herod Agrippa, who was an authority on Jewish traditions and customs, expressed interest in hearing Paul. Festus agreed, and so he made a special meeting for Herod Agrippa and Bernice to hear Paul speak for himself. The next day, Festus arranged this special meeting in the auditorium of Herod's palace in Caesarea. Herod Agrippa and Bernice arrived with great pomp and ceremony, along with all of the high-ranking military commanders and dignitaries of Caesarea. Once they were seated, Festus called for Paul to be brought out. Festus made a few introductory comments to the audience concerning Paul explaining about his case. Festus explained to Herod Agrippa that after examining Paul, he had determined that Paul had done nothing deserving of death, and yet Paul had appealed to Caesar. Because of Herod Agrippa's extensive knowledge of Jewish customs and beliefs, Festus was therefore asking for Herod's assistance in advising him on how to frame his report to Caesar concerning Paul. Herod Agrippa then addressed Paul and told him, you're permitted to speak for yourself. Paul saluted Agrippa, and then he began to deliver his speech. Paul's audience was highly distinguished, and so Paul addressed them in a formal, highly classical literary style. Paul began by first telling King Agrippa how happy he was to state his case before Agrippa, because Paul knew that Agrippa was considered an expert concerning Jewish customs and laws. Paul asked for Agrippa's patience in hearing him out. Paul then began to share his personal testimony. Paul explained how he had been raised in Judaism as a Pharisee since the time of his youth. The sect of the Pharisees was the strictest party within religious Judaism. Paul also explained that his reputation as a strict Pharisee since the time of his youth was well known among his fellow Jewish countrymen. In fact, if his critics were willing to admit it, they had known Paul well for a long time because Paul had formerly been one of them. Paul had previously enjoyed a privileged, high-profile status as a Pharisee in Judaism. Paul had been the personal disciple of Israel's most distinguished rabbi, Gamaliel. Paul had been on the fast track to success within religious Judaism. Such was Paul's status among his Jewish peers prior to his conversion that he was able to obtain authority from the high priest to hunt down, persecute, arrest, and imprison Christians. Like the rest of Israel's leaders, Paul was violently opposed to Christ and Christianity. He was therefore motivated to attempt everything within his power to permanently stamp out the growing Christian movement. Paul explained to Herod Agrippa that he had arrested and imprisoned many Christians. At their court trials, Paul had cast his vote in favor of their receiving the death sentence. Prior to his conversion then, Paul's hands were stained with the innocent blood of many Christian martyrs. Such was his hatred for Christ that he had punished Jewish Christians wherever he could, including in many foreign cities, and he had even forced many Christians to blaspheme. Paul had elaborated on his religious zeal as a Pharisee in the Epistle to the Philippians. There he described himself, circumcised the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. The Hebrews were the ultra-Orthodox religious Jews within Judaism, as opposed to the Jewish Hellenists, who were more culturally and socially integrated and less strict. In describing himself as a Hebrew of the Hebrews, Paul is saying that he was one of the strictest members of the strictest sects within Judaism. In describing himself as blameless concerning the righteousness in the law, Paul is not claiming to have been sinless or morally perfect. No human being can make such a claim except for the Son of God, Jesus Christ. What Paul is saying is what many of his own Jewish contemporaries would have also claimed, 
that he had strictly and carefully observed the ceremonies and rituals of Judaism since the time of his youth. All of this Paul was explaining to Herod Agrippa to make the important point that Paul had been a key insider within religious Judaism. Paul was therefore not some unknown outsider. He had been a major player, someone that his Jewish contemporaries all had known well, someone whom they had previously respected and admired. He had lived like them, thought like them, worshipped and acted like them. In short, Paul was formerly one of them. What then had changed? What had caused Paul to go from being a former leader and insider in religious Judaism to one who was now hated, reviled, and vilified by his former friends and colleagues? Paul would sum it up in one word, resurrection. Paul told Agrippa and the others, And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. To this promise are twelve tribes, earnestly serving God night and day, hope to attain. For this hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused by the Jews. Why should it be thought incredible by you that God raises the dead? Recall that this is the key issue that Paul had brought up in his hearing in Jerusalem before the Sanhedrin in Acts chapter 23. There Paul had cried out, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. Concerning the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am being judged. This had caused a division in the Sanhedrin between the Pharisees, who believed in God's promise of resurrection, and the Sadducees, who did not. Here then is the irony. As a religious sect within Judaism, the Pharisees claimed to believe in the promise of the resurrection. And yet, when they heard the good news of Christ's resurrection, they didn't believe. Why not? Their rejection of Christ was not merely based on the factual claim of Christ's resurrection, because they themselves believe in God's promise of resurrection. The real issue was Christ himself. Jesus had confronted the Pharisees repeatedly for their hypocrisy and insincerity. But rather than fearing God and repenting, the Pharisees had feared the people more. John writes concerning the Pharisees in John chapter 12, For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Jesus had publicly embarrassed the Pharisees before the people by rebuking them. His primary purpose wasn't to shame them, but to correct them. But even if Jesus hadn't personally and directly confronted them, his lifestyle and teaching itself confronted and embarrassed the Pharisees because it revealed how corrupt and hypocritical they were. Jesus' humble, sincere way of living was such a refreshing contrast to the Pharisees' proud, self-serving pretense. The Pharisees only made an outward show of righteousness, but Jesus explained that God was more concerned with a true righteousness on the inside. As David writes in Psalm 51, Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. Jesus had essentially instructed his hearers concerning the Pharisees, Do as they say, but not as they do. In other words, whatever the Pharisees taught that was biblical and true, the people should heed and obey, because it was God's inspired, authoritative word. But even though the message was true, the people should beware of the false messengers, because the Pharisees didn't practice what they preached. The Pharisees had therefore rejected Jesus because they had been unwilling to repent and obey him. Instead, they had plotted his death. Now, the same Jesus whom they had rejected and murdered was now reported to be alive and well. This was inconceivable to them, not because they doubted the possibility of resurrection, but because of who had been reportedly resurrected, Jesus. Even though the message of the gospel offered complete forgiveness, even to those who had hated and murdered Jesus, still the Pharisees overall remained unwilling to repent. How tragic it is that pride blinds a person to the truth. This is why Jesus told the Pharisees, Therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. We see such a contrast between the Pharisees' response to the gospel and the response of Peter's hearers on the day of Pentecost. Peter had boldly preached the gospel to over 3,000 Jewish pilgrims at the Feast of Pentecost in Jerusalem. He told them, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When Peter's hearers heard this, they were cut to the heart. In other words, they believed Peter's message. Because they believed him, they were convicted of their sin. This is the right response of a person who rightly hears the gospel. 
It's never enough to merely believe in the possibility of resurrection. We must more importantly understand what Christ's resurrection means. Because Christ lives, he is victorious over sin and death. He is victorious over everything. It means that one day, everyone will give an accounting of their lives to God's Son, Jesus Christ. Paul had told the Athenians this in the Areopagus in Acts chapter 17. He told them that God has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. When the Athenians heard this, some mocked and rejected Paul's message, not because they hated Jesus, but because they didn't believe in resurrection. By contrast, the Pharisees believed in the resurrection, but they hated Jesus because of who he is. What does this tell us? For one thing, it tells us that faith in Christ is never merely academic. It's not enough to merely believe the correct doctrines. James writes that the demons also believe in God and they tremble, yet they're not saved. It's true that we must believe in correct doctrine, but saving faith is always much more than head knowledge. Saving faith is heart faith. Paul writes in Romans chapter 10 that it is with the heart man believes unto righteousness, that is, unto a new nature in Christ. In other words, heart faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ is to result in spiritual rebirth. Let's believe in the good news of the gospel, not merely with a nominal academic belief, but with a committed, surrendered heart faith. Let's believe not only in the facts of the historical gospel, but especially in who Jesus is. Let's learn to love Jesus' character, Jesus' teachings, and Jesus' lifestyle. Let's learn to follow Christ because we love him. Let's learn to love Jesus because we believe in him. Thank you.